Hey, uh, welcome to our talk today. Uh, we'll be talking about decentralized routing for a sharded application on service mesh. Uh, I'm Vinay Gonaguntla, and this is Pankaj Sika. So we are software engineers at Intuit, and we work on the service mesh platform at Intuit. So let me go over uh, the agenda for today. Um, we'll be talking about um, a little bit about what service mesh is and how it is set up at Intuit. A uh, little bit about the uh, sharded application and how routing is done on a sharded application, our design, and uh, some challenges we faced. We'll go over the demo, as well as uh, some future uh, investment we have on the solution. So a uh, little bit about Intuit. Uh, Intuit is a leading fintech company. Um, I would consider ourselves more of a bleeding edge a platform company. Uh, we are really um, honored to have received the end user award for 2019 as well as 2022. Uh, if you look at the CNCF portfolio, Intuit pretty much uses most of the products there. Um, we also are a big open source contributor. Uh, we contribute to more than 75 plus uh, projects and some of the projects we uh, maintain and our open source are Argo, uh, Kiko, Admiral and uh, Numaproj. So uh, let me go into a little bit of the scale at which Intuit operates. Um, Intuit has more than 245 plus Kubernetes clusters running in production. Uh, we span about 16,000 namespaces in those clusters. At peak, uh, we recorded more than 77,000 nodes are uh, running in production uh, with more than 7 million pods. And we have 2,000 plus unique services which are running among these clusters. And uh, these services are a mix of both um, end user services as well as internal services. So next, I want to just walk through Service Mesh. Uh, how many of you here know what Service Mesh is? I think most of you do, so I can go a little fast on this section. Um, service Mesh is an infrastructure layer to facilitate service-to-service -service communication. I think the most popular um, approach right now is to use a sidecar to intercept traffic for ingress and egress. Uh, communication through the application. Um, this allows us to do a few cool things with, uh, uh, by adding a sidecar or uh, using service mesh. Some of them are uh, security um, by providing mutual TLS, observability by taking a snapshot of the entire system and uh, finding the bottlenecks, routing by providing um, things like uh, canary or uh, traffic splitting, and also reliability by automating retries. Uh, some of the most uh, popular uh, open service mesh offerings out there are Istio, Linkerd, and uh, Console. Uh, we at Intuit use Istio as our service mesh platform. Uh, so this is a little bit about Istio. Um, since most of you are familiar, I'll just uh, go through this pretty quick. Uh, Istio has, um, or many service meshes are mainly divided logically into two parts, control plane and data plane. Uh, the data plane part is where uh, the service or the application lies, and uh, this is where the communication happens. And to basically um, uh, maintain or configure these proxies, we have a control plane section. And uh, here I'm just uh, mentioning two important components in Istio. Uh, one is uh, pilot and other is galley. Pilot is responsible for configuring the proxy, and galley is mainly for uh, uh, user configuration management, and uh, it listens to your requests and sends the instructions to Pilot. So at Intuit, we have a multi-cluster Istio setup. Um, so here I'm just representing like three clusters with Istio installed individually, uh, Istio control plane in, in, installed individually in each of these cl clusters. Now think of a communication, say, from service C to service B, uh, which is within the cluster, and Istio is responsible for that. Now, for example, if you think of uh, communication, say, from service A to service C or service C to service D, uh, this would require some sort of a multi-cluster setup. Uh, we use Admiral as our open source um, control, uh, control plane component, which manages uh, different Istio uh, resources among these clusters and allows communication between uh, different uh, services uh, here. So uh, now that we have an overview of Service Mesh at Intuit, I'll hand it off to uh, Pankaj, who will talk a little bit about our use case. Thanks, Vinay. Um, Thanks, Vinay, for the introduction. Um, so 
before I dive into the details, a little bit about the uh, traffic, the way it's handled at Intuit, right? So all the north-south traffic uh, at Intuit is handled through Intuit Managed API Gateway. And internally, we are going through this journey of moving um, all these uh, internal application traffic to service mesh. While we were going through this journey, um, we came across this use case where an internal service wanted to talk to a sharded application, um, which was you know, distributed across multiple shards. Um, before we, uh, you know, get into the details about, uh, so, so basically what we had to do was solve for which particular shard a request needs to go based on the request context. Before we dive into the details, I think it's, uh, I'll touch upon why uh, a sharded application is required and what sharded application is. So think of a normal web application which is fronted by API gateway and has a bunch of users that are making requests to it. As the number of users grow, um, there's some kind of, uh, some need of uh, some scaling on the web application. One approach to do so is sharding, where the web application splits its data into multiple uh, shards. And API Gateway, uh, the way it makes the routing decision to these shards, uh, it could do so by maintaining a static list. But as the number of users grow even further, uh, static list is no longer a viable approach, and there's a need for a better solution. At Intuit, uh, what we do is we have an external lookup service that has the logic um, and uh, it, it can, you know, uh, it's using the, basically the same backend as these web applications. So it knows where the data is sharded uh, and it also has an algorithm to determine uh, the shard where it needs to go to. So Gateway uh, makes a call to this lookup service and then uh, it knows what shard it needs to route it to. To make these lookups more efficient, we are also using a distributed cache. So uh, one example of an application that does that at Intuit is uh, QuickBooks Online, uh, which is an accounting software. Uh, more than 150,000 uh, companies use it, and there are uh, more than 5 million customers across the globe. So uh, let's, let's look at uh, how this routing looks like when uh, we have to do so on mesh. In this diagram, uh, what you see on the left is service A, uh, which has a sidecar proxy. It's trying to communicate with a sharded application, which is distributed among three different shards. So here, uh, the routing decision can be made on the Envoy proxy, or uh, one approach uh, is to let this request go through API Gateway as well. Um, but then that introduces an additional hop between the service-to-service -service communication. And um, usually, what, what, uh, the services that talk to each other a lot are co-located within the same cluster, um, probably also within the same VPC. And then this call uh, adds network latency by going out of the VPC and back in and so on. Right? So we can avoid that by using service mesh. So the approach we took uh, was to uh, implement the routing logic within the uh, proxy itself. Um, but before we go there, uh, I want to uh, you know, go through the goals we had uh, for this uh, approach. So as uh, the shards are maintained uh, by, by the services themselves, we did not want the client to be aware of them. Uh, the, it, these uh, decisions need to be transparent to the client services as well. So we did not want to have any changes, or if any changes, they, we wanted them to be very minimal. Then. Um, also, uh, as I spoke about the QBO use case, which shards its uh, uh, data based on the company IDs, um, uh, we have to handle that. And also, other applications that enter it that have millions of users, uh, they may shard their data based upon a user location, multiple criteria. So, we, our solution needed to handle all those use cases as well. So uh, when, uh, imagine I'll go back to the QBO example, uh, when the data in a particular shard uh, you know, grows beyond a certain threshold, there could be a requirement of uh, dividing that uh, data into multiple further shards. And uh, this uh, needs to be supported in near real time as well. So we don't want to cause any disruption to the ongoing traffic uh, and the routing decisions still need to be made correctly. Right? Um, as I mentioned earlier, service owners control the routing configuration. Uh, we wanted this to be transparent to the client side, so no changes on the client side. The, uh, we wanted to give this control to the service owners. Um, so we went out and uh, looked at the existing solutions that the service mesh had to offer. 
uh, since we were using Istio service mesh, I'll uh, look at Istio examples here. Istio provides a custom resource called virtual service, which defines a set of uh, traffic rules that apply when a given host is addressed. In this, uh, in this example, right, uh, whenever a request is made to demo.greeting.mesh, um, uh, these traffic rules will apply. And each traffic rule uh, defines the protocol and the matching criteria. In this example, company ID 1 and 2, uh, those requests are routed to shard 1, uh, whereas the requests for company ID 3 are routed to shard 2. This is very uh, a basic example of a virtual service. And, uh, but then uh, the virtual service did not work for us uh, due to some limitations uh, uh, due to our use cases. Uh, so there were maintainability problems. What I mean by that is uh, if we have to uh, incorporate a routing logic in the virtual service, uh, there has to be some kind of coupling between the sharding logic and it has to go to the virtual service, which needs to be created into multiple clusters where the client services exist. So this is a lot of overhead. And then also uh, the size of the virtual service object itself can grow a lot, um, which is uh, again a management problem. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, we need near real-time updates. Imagine a new company getting added, and we need that sharding info reflected in the virtual service. Uh, this, is, uh, this is not possible with the virtual service approach. We have to update the virtual service every time a new company gets added across all the shard again, right? across all the client clusters. Uh, and then if the data uh, can move among the shards as well, Virtual service, as you are aware, it's a, a static mapping, so we, we cannot uh, make that decision in the virtual service. So due to these limitations, uh, we uh, started designing our solution, and I'll walk through that approach, what we took. Um, in this diagram, we'll see a request that is originating on the, this is, this block is the client that is making a request to, the, to a sharded application divided into three different shards. Uh, so when an HTTP uh, client makes a request to the sharded application, um, the on-web proxy intercepts this request, uh, as, as always. So on-web proxy has a filter chain, and uh, Istio provides a custom resource called on-web filter that uh, gives the capability to extend the on-web proxy. And we have built the logic in an HTTP filter, or HTTP on-web filter that uh, applies to all the sidecar outbound requests. So what this uh, on-way filter does is, uh, as if you remember the API gateway use case, the same uh, lookup service is called to ask where a particular request needs to be routed to based on the request context. And uh, the lookup service responds with the DNS of the uh, shard that it needs to go to. Then the, within the on-way filter, we are able to route the request to that shard. Now this creation of the on-way filter, we have uh, automated this through Admiral, uh, which is an uh, open source tool under the Istio ecosystem interface that Intuit uh, manages. Uh, so, so what Admiral does is it uh, you know, looks for, defines custom resources that allow it to create on-way filters and other Istio specific uh, resources in the client clusters. So uh, this is how, uh, with this solution, this is how the dynamic routing at Intuit looks like. Uh, this typically uh, source service and the destination service live in different clusters. And uh, uh, for uh, Admiral lies on top of all the clusters. It watches all the clusters for the custom resources it defines. And it creates um, Istio resources in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in all the clusters where it needs to, uh, to make the uh, mesh, uh, like the life of the mesh operators and developers easier. So uh, for this dynamic routing use case, we introduced a new custom resource called routing policy. Routing policy uh, defines um, just the config that needs to go to the on-way filter. So the on-way filter uh, can be created with that config. Now, Admiral watches for it, and it has a mapping of all the clusters where a particular service's dependencies exist. So it's able to create uh, the on-way filter and the source, uh, source cluster as well. So this is how um, uh, the routing policy gets translated to the on-way filter. Now we understand, uh, so this, uh, this is basically the manifest of a routing policy on the right and how Admiral translates it to an on-way filter on the left. If you observe the config section is pretty much the same 
Uh, it's just that you know it's rearranged to fit the Envoy filter spec. And the Envoy filter that we create is also a HTTP filter that uh, matches all the requests that are uh, for the sidecar outbound context. Uh, now, I'll, uh, now we understand the solution. There were some challenges associated with it uh, that I'll walk through. So we use workload selectors, uh, which are provided by Envoy filter custom resource to match the client workloads where a particular filter needs to apply to. So because the workloads filter can only match one workload as of now, so uh, what it meant for us is uh, that if a given service has 10 different clients in a cluster, we have to create 10 different Envoy filters. Uh, because uh, the OR operation was not supported, uh, we were not able to use that. We also use uh, TinyGo um, and Wasm for creating our Envoy filters. Uh, due to the limitations uh, that TinyGo has, it does not uh, expose full language feature set. Uh, we could not use an internal cache within the Envoy filter. So we had to create an external uh, caching service to make the uh, calls to the lookup service more efficient. Also, um, uh, the, the logic where uh, the Envoy filter makes a call to the lookup service and, and then it also retries based on uh, you know, if the data is present in a shard or not, that logic had to be pre-built in the Envoy proxy. Uh, we, uh, we did that because uh, so, so anytime we need to update, uh, update that logic, right? We have to rebuild the Envoy proxy and then make sure the client workloads are rotated. Um, we had to do that because the version of Istio we were using uh, earlier did not support Wasm plugin. Uh, but now with the newer versions, we can use Wasm plugin, which can load um, all this business logic dynamically. So uh, uh, th that's it for the challenges. Uh, I'll hand it over to uh, Vinay now, who will show us a live demo. Thanks, Pankaj. So uh, before I go through the demo, I, I just want to explain a little bit about the demo setup. So this is how our demo is set up. We have a sharded application uh, with three shards. And we have a company data in the 9,000 range in shard one, 8,000 range in shard two, and 7,000 range in shard three. And uh, we have a curl client, uh, which is basically requesting data from the sharded application. And as you saw before, um, we have a lookup service and a cache or lying in between, which gives us the information about the shard. So uh, let me switch the screen here. So uh, this is a Kiali dashboard. Kiali is an observability dashboard, which shows uh, exactly what uh, traffic is running within uh, a service mesh and within a cluster. So here, you don't see any connections because we don't have traffic, live traffic yet. But you can see all the components that I described. We have all the, the three shards, the client, the router and cache, and the lookup service. So let's go to the configuration first. Uh, I hope it's visible to everyone. So this is um, basically the routing policy we are using, um, the same spec what Pankaj uh, explained about. So we have a cache section here, and uh, we have a host section here. So host section is basically the URL we are going to use from the client, which gets overwritten to one of the shard URLs. And on the left, I'm uh, doing a watch. So let me rerun the watch once more. Oops. So I'm doing a watch on Envoy filters on the client cluster here. So uh, this is going to uh, update automatically because once I create the routing policy, Admiral adds an Envoy filter onto the client cluster. So let me create that. And here you see a new um, uh, Envoy filter that got created. We can uh, take a look at that Envoy filter to see uh, how it looks. So if you see here, I mean, pretty much the same configuration is copied over from the routing policy to uh, the Envoy filter. One thing you can uh, note is the workload selector. Um, workload selector applies only to the um, client here and not to any other workloads. So this is uh, determined by Admiral by maintaining a map. Um, next, I, I have, uh, I'm tailing logs from uh, the different shards. Um, so this is shard one, shard two, and shard three. And also I'm tailing logs from a lookup service. So now we know that Envoy filter got applied to the client. So I can run some requests from the client, um, uh, from the client uh, section. So let me copy over a request. 
So I'm just uh, doing a slash company and using the same URL as, uh, as one we configured before. So now first I will um, search for something in the 9,000 range and we expect the request to go to shard one uh, and the lookup service. So here you see a log showing up in lookup service. First it looks up uh, the, uh, where the uh, data for 9,000 is and then routes it to shard one. So rerunning the request multiple times, uh, you see it just goes to shard one because we cache the data inside our, uh, uh, inside our service. Um, similarly, if I try a request, um, say in the 8,000 range, um, we expect it to go to shard two and you see a, a, a log in lookup service as well as shard two. And repeating the request, you oh, oops, I just did it for, yeah. Repeating the request, you just see it going to shard two. Similarly, I can also do a request on shard three, which is a 7,000 range company. And yeah, you can see that showing up there. So now we can see this a little bit better in the Kiali dashboard. So here uh, you can see um, client uh, talking to shard one, shard two, and shard three. And you see some uh, unknown connection happening to router and lookup. Uh, right now, Kiali does not have a ability to show um, Envoy filter calls, so it shows it up as unknown. But basically, the filter is making a call to route, router and lookup, getting the uh, shard DNS, sending it to the or rewriting it for the client, and the client communicates to the uh, multiple shards located here. So um, uh, now let's uh, go back to the slides. Uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the future work we planned for this. Uh, we want to also add client-side rate limiting uh, using the similar approach of creating an envoy filter and um, you know at the client side and rate limiting it there, and the services can control that. Uh, also, we wanted to work with the Istio community and see if we can enhance the workload selector. As you saw um, before, uh, we have to create one workload selector per client. If you could. May, uh, find a way to add one workload selector per cluster and apply it to all the clients. Uh, we would want to explore that approach. Uh, also, we use TinyGo uh, as our uh, WASM language, and we did that um, because of more familiarity with Golang. Uh, but TinyGo has a limited feature set, and we wanted to look at maybe C++ and Rust to uh, you know, enhance the uh, entire um, uh, solution to better cater for uh, for our uh, use case. Um, that's it for the presentation, guys. Uh, if you have any feedback, please uh, uh, take a snapshot of this and let us know. Uh, also, you can uh, talk to us on the Admiral channel uh, in the Istio, um, Slack. Istio Slack. And also, we are open for any questions you have on this. We have one here. Yeah. yeah, just one. Give me one second. Uh, just get. So in the introduction, you you mentioned about the shard application for magnetic applications. Can you elaborate more how you shard your magnetic application to the shard the the, the pods? Uh, uh, can you repeat that once more? So uh, you mentioned that this is a sharded application, right? right. For a monolithic application. Right. Can you explain how you shard that? So we shard it based on company IDs right now. Pardon me? So company IDs. Uh, we sh I mean, the, the sharding logic is a little more complex. It's based on business logic, but we shard it based on the company IDs. Uh, so for us, QBO is the application, uh, which uh, is a basically a sharded application. And we shard it based on company IDs, and that could be based on region or based on locality and things like that. So, so it's, it's a complex logic. It's not uh, just based on IDs of this range. To so this range. the sharding logic, uh, we don't need to, uh, you know, for, for our solution, we don't really need to think about what the logic is uh, for sharding that the applications are using. We as, uh, you know, mesh operators, uh, mesh platform owners, uh, what we uh, do is we provide them the capability to have that uh, uh, to, ha to have that sharding logic reflect in the lookup service, and from mesh standpoint, we just make a call to the lookup service and it returns the shard uh, uh, that is there. And it could be the sharding logic itself could be depending upon use case, right? For example, QBO 
which charge its data based on the company IDs, uh, can do so using the company information and the request, uh, and it can identify where a request goes to depending upon the request context, right? And then uh, another, uh, like for example, uh, other uh, teams at Intuit that charge their data based on customer location, for, for instance, they can just return, uh, you know, get the request context based on the origin and stuff like that, they can return the shard information. And all this is managed within the lookup service. But do you do anything to re-architect your applications to make them sharded? No. Uh, I mean, it, I mean, it, it was built require. that way. So we didn't, uh, we, I mean, if you're asking, uh, are we moving to shard, regular application to sharded? Uh, that's, that wasn't the intention. So they are, they are built that way as a sharded application for scaling. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think you mentioned about uh, drawbacks of virtual service and limitations for those. Um, uh, spe specifically talking about uh, being able to build routes dynamically and, and possibly growing virtual service. Um, you know, did you consider um, creating or adding these through um, uh, controllers? Yeah, so um, I, I just want to clarify, it's not like a drawback of virtual service itself, but you know the kind of use cases that we were trying to solve for with virtual service, we could not use it for. So uh, to your question, uh, do we use controllers to update the virtual services? As I mentioned, uh, we already have Admiral. Uh, that, uh, that is like a management plane for the Istio control plane. Um, we already had that in place, and that was the easiest route to take. And it could potentially update the virtual services, but then we would have to tie the sharding logic. Admiral has to know the sharding logic and then update the virtual services accordingly. So uh, we, we wanted to avoid that complexity. Thank you. Uh, did you notice any latency issue or uh, memory uh, change in memory or CPU usage yeah. in the um, uh, Envoy sidecars? Uh, good question. So uh, first thing on uh, latency. So initially we were doing a lookup for every request that definitely added a couple of milliseconds of latency. So that's when we introduced a cache. Uh, we still have sub-second uh, sub lat uh, yeah. latency, but it, it was acceptable for our solution. And uh, for uh, CPU usage, yes, we do uh, incur a little bit more uh, whenever you add a new Envoy filter. Uh, but it, it was negligible to uh, any other solution we were using. Yeah. Okay. Hi. First of all, great presentation, wonderful engineering. Uh, my question is: so, on which cluster did you apply the routing policy? So, uh, the routing policy, as I said, the service owner controls how the sharding happens, and then the routing policy happens on the destination cluster where the service is running. So the service owner defines the routing policy as they also dictate the sharding logic. So that's the config that gets translated to the Envoy filter. And so does, so do they apply it on one sharded cluster or uh, an admiral takes care of the rest or do they apply it on every cluster? Yeah, admiral knows where a particular service's dependencies are. There's another custom resource that uh, admiral defines. It's called dependency. That is how, you know, when a service gets created, uh, there's also a, a dependency custom resource they define, which tells them what all clients it needs to apply to. And each workload that is running in our multi-cluster setup has an identity associated with it, um, and it's unique uh, per service. So Admiral knows what all clusters uh, the clients of that application are running in. And that's how it's able to, you know, create the Envoy filter in those clusters. And it can do so in all of them. Thank you. Um, so, in the client, in the filter that you built, you need to extract the the ID to route the shard to, right, or to route the request to. Mm -hmm. How are you doing that extraction, and doesn't that tightly couple your client um, filter? We don't. We don't. Uh, yeah. So, the, so the entire logic of that was in the lookup service. We just forward the path, oh. the entire request path to the lookup service. Path and, the lookup and headers. Service, yeah, right. path and headers, and lookup service gives it back. That's our implementation. But, I mean, as you said, we, we could you could uh, you know regex it and break it up and 
send it. So yeah, so, our solution just involves lookup service to take care of that information. Yeah, so, so our solution provides you a capability to define a routing policy, which creates an HTTP sidecar route bound filter on the clients uh, that that service has. Right? What you do with that on web filter is uh, you know dependent dependent upon your use case. Okay, thank you. Uh, you mentioned why um, the virtual routes would not work for your use case. Are there any other methods that you tried or explored that didn't work for any particular reason? I mean, uh, we tried one more, but it wasn't really for this use case. Uh, it was the authent-based Envoy filter. Um, but it wasn't really for this use case. Where it, you can do an external call to an authentication a service and get and get it back, but that didn't give us that doesn't give you a metadata back. It just gives you a 200 OK and forwards the request. So that kind of didn't work for our favor. So yeah, that's why we built. Also, we we wanted to uh, you know uh, if any other solutions did not give us the flexibility to uh, adapt our uh, solution for multiple use cases. As I mentioned, right, the QBO charges data based on a company and then other multiple other applications that into it with millions of users, they shard their data based on user data. So we wanted to support those and routing policy allows us to give this flexibility to the service owners to define the config they want to use and also you know, uh, define the lookup service that, that needs to be used for that. Yeah, yeah if, if you guys want to try this out, uh, uh, we, ha we will push this up onto the Admiral repo, uh, which is part of the um, Istio ecosystem. ecosystem. So uh, yeah, this feature is live on Admiral, so you guys can play with it as well. All right, there's a question there. Yeah, so I have one question regarding, so when the source cluster, you have created on my filter, right? There is a VM underscore code section, and you have added a binary called VASM, VASM binary, right? How do, you, uh, how do you guys are storing that binary uh, in the Vinay, container? Would you like to because yeah. we had some issue with binary storing the container because we build the binary and we created some uh, config map and the config map supports are like 100 MB of some maximum. If it yeah. is more than that, uh, we, it cannot even store, right? Yeah. So what we did, it basically we used the Nginx, con Nginx proxy and we put all the binaries in there and then we are calling that Nginx VASM binary from the container. So how you guys like, if the binary is like more than 100 MB or like how you are guys like yeah, using I mean, a very good question. Um, yeah. So uh, for this solution, right, uh, I, I'm not sure if this is what you wanted to hear, but for this solution, mm -hmm. uh, we pre-built the Envoy proxy. Um, we, uh, we, have the, we just do a copy of the WASM binary into the Envoy proxy image, uh, and we just uh, reference it in our uh, Envoy filter. Oh, okay. Yeah, so this is the, the, the reason for this is we used uh, 1.10 and below Istio when we designed the solution and that was the approach we took. But WASM plugins would give you that opportunity, right? Yes, it does... we tried it, but at that time, this was like authentication problem was issues. So I'm not right, sure yeah. like how, how it was. I mean, we tried around like one year back. Yeah, so. WASM plugin, we did some POCs with it. It worked for us. We pull it from something like Artifactory or a Docker Hub mm -hmm. and it works just fine. Yeah, and, and did you mention that uh, there's a limit of 100 MB for that plugin uh, to be loaded? No, I'm saying in Kubernetes, we've tried with uh, like uh, config maps, right? Oh, the config, the config map, map is yeah, exceeding the limit that HCD allows. But, uh, yeah, okay. Our WASM binary was more than 100 MB, but it was not fine. Got yeah. it, got okay. it, okay. Uh, and if you're writing a WASM plugin more than 100, 100 MB, MB that's, that's, <laughs> that's pretty much, I mean, yeah. I don't know. I'm just saying okay, that's okay. pretty big. I do believe that's all the time we have for questions today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.